I understand that stock market is a dense jungle and everyone starts at the same point of time, at the same point. Uh, Elliott Waves is just an advanced form of patterns. Elliott Wave is not subjective. Okay. That's a myth. Elliott Wave is dynamic but not subjective. Uh, Elliott Waves is a complete science. If you want to play Elliott Waves, then you have to understand corrective patterns first. The founder of Wave Analytics and Trading Chakra, Mr. Piyush Chaudhary is famous because of his specialization in Elliott Waves theory when it comes to trading. Join me in this candid podcast where I walk you through his journey and we will get some trading related insights from him. <laughs> Hi Piyush, uh, thank you so much for doing this and we are very honored to have you here at the headquarters of Upsurge. First of all, how are you doing? I am doing very well and the pleasure is entirely mine being here. That's great. So, uh, one prominent thing that I've noticed about you, I have interacted with many traders with you now, so you have already a finance background. Hai. You have had an MBA in finance right. as a degree. Do you think that holds value in your trading journey in any way? Do you get an edge from uh, Initially, you think that maybe there is an edge or something uh, because we have had a little bit of uh, lectures during colleges on technical analysis and all but when we start with the trading part I understand that stock market is a dense jungle okay. and everyone starts at the same point of time at the same point and uh, from there everyone proceeds uh, most people get hunted by the predators during the first two three years of the journey hmm. but the ones who survive are the ones who have a great common sense derived from their uh, through their age, through their experience, through their education and who have a great emotional control right. and uh, understanding of the fear, greed, hope, panic cycles uh, that emotional discipline makes a lot of difference in stock markets and what I believe uh, is another thing that is an edge is the ability to learn and grasp the new things Correct so experience is given more weightage rather than you know a degree or your experience in the markets in but the yeah market. see people who have survived in people who have been street smart and yeah. lived or did have done something in their real life so they are likely to have a higher success ratio in the stock markets Correct. rather than Correct. someone who is coming directly from some institution so talking about experiences, you have had a vast experience. I think one of the companies was Motilal Oswal, the other was KR Choksi. Could you just run us through your background once? So when I decided to join stock markets, when I wanted to work in stock markets, now uh, I had only a little bit of theoretical idea huh. uh, by reading some books, especially Martin Pring books and uh, various other books basically. So I had only some idea of reading some books what trading could be but what happens exactly on the floor I had no clue right. so for that uh, I tried some jobs in Delhi I belong to Faridabad and I tried for some jobs in Delhi and I could not find anything so after several months I decided to come to Bombay okay I hit uh, Bombay with a bag and started looking for a job Kiar Choksi was my first job which I got in December 2003 hmm. so I'm almost going to complete 20, 20 years, years on that. Right. So yeah, uh, so KR Choksi, when I uh, joined the dealing desk, I realized that how the markets are moving. And I literally found it very difficult sitting from 9.55 to 3.30, which was the uh, time at that point of time, hmm. and focus on markets. I used to get drained out five and a half hours and I used to get completely drained out. Yeah. So those concentration powers were not there. Uh, hmm. So hmm. I understood that this is going to be a very difficult task, getting that much concentration and then applying those things day in, day out. In 2004, when I saw uh, lower circuit, even I was rattled completely. So I learned a lot of things on the floor through right. uh, obviously trading for the clients, trading for the prop, trading for the uh, people whom I worked for. So uh, those were really the learning years. Uh, even if less on the technical side which I tried doing by a, I used to buy a lot of books hmm. whatever money I saved hmm. from my salaries I used to buy books from Amazon.us oh, Amazon.com okay. US mm -hmm. and the book used to come here in two two and a half months wow. so we never had an uh, we never had those the books the luxury of resources right? uh, in India at that point of time the, right. forget the software forget the laptops 
so there were very few software also so on the technical part i was still struggling but the emotional part was getting refined at that point of time mm -hmm. sitting on the screen throughout every day for 5 6 years i have done uh, a job of a dealer oh okay okay basically we, we were called dealers then we were called rms relationship managers but the job was the same we Correct. were supposed to handle the client trading portfolios or the investment portfolios Correct. so the emotional part was getting refined the what was happening in the markets the cycles were getting built in uh, through the uh, whatever instinctive part of the memory was forming so there uh, the help was from the more from the emotional discipline point of view yeah so the jobs that you had done before trading full time they were concentrated on fundamental investing right they were more of long term investment strategies how did you get into trading as a profession so not really uh, the first job that i joined kr choksi they were fundamental investors i worked with kishan bhai himself right. and i used to uh, look after the prop portfolio prop book uh, the family portfolio rather and a few clients but uh, they were core investors hmm. but later on as i moved to motilal oswal and mf global they there used to be a lot of futures trading okay. as well okay. so uh, there i got in touch with the trading part of various things okay nice nice talking about trading uh, what makes you so witty on twitter because even i have been reading your tweets <laughs> and they are pretty funny so what what is the secret sauce of that and i think that could yeah. be something genetic <laughs> or okay. maybe i have been too much influenced by the 90s satire of jaspal bhatti and uh, maybe the friends uh, era right. friends era okay. and what not but yeah so whatever used to come to my mind and you know uh, those times pre 2020 whatsapp was still not a rage probably a rage after 2015 16 hmm. there used to be a lot of whatsapp forwards so whenever i used to watch those videos a hmm. little bit so i used to co automatically connect them with the markets now okay. i never used to post them initially i never even knew that these this is called meme hmm. so i i never even knew the term meme, meme. but okay. then i started posting people with whatever caption i liked with whatever had happened in the market at that point of time and people liked it so i so basically social media was what social media at that time was you just have fun Yeah. So there yeah. was no influencer concept there was no uh, formation mm -hmm. of a content creator or a meme uh, word terminology was not there yes. so mm -hmm. all those things were not there i was not aware even if they were there so uh, we were just having fun <laughs> so thing things changed much later after covid people were just sitting at home became influencers uh, and suddenly everyone's following grew so right but yeah i was just having fun Does it help you with trading in any way? So I am basically a futures trader. I have to wait a lot for my setups to form. So during those waiting periods, it's better to come and come on Twitter and have some fun. Okay. So yeah, it it basically lightens you. So I, you can call me that. Okay, maybe I was just having fun from my point of view only. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was never to serve anyone or any purpose. I was just nice. having fun for myself. Yeah. yeah. and uh, piyush do you trade with your entire capital or do you have some left for investing or other long term uh, strategies that you have in mind see when we started trading when i started trading so uh, obviously we i did not even have enough capital to you know slowly slowly we have built enough capital to trade hmm. then there was then for several years i was pretty much trading with my entire capital okay. several years okay in fact uh, till 2015 16 or so for about 5 7 years i have traded with my entire capital oh okay, okay. Uh, because the capital was not very much enough and later on margins also kept rising so uh, but i literally had never any, any issues trading my entire capital and uh, in fact when i was trading my entire capital i was far more focused uh, right. on the on the pattern formations on my entries on my oh. exits far too too much of concentration i used to have complete concentration from 9:15 to 3:30 i would not even move uh, so that because i could not afford any losses true, so true. Uh, i would give my best to every trade uh, i would sit in cash most of the time but deploy it only when i was uh, certain about certain the trade about so my drawdowns were lesser hmm. uh, they were in control my i was very prompt with my stops the moment capital started growing i be, i think i became a little laid back then uh, i would i bigger cycles 
I would think that I'm a bigger trader now. And so the drawdowns increased. Uh, but right now, things are much different. Obviously, I added various other factors, algos as well. Uh, but right now, ma majority part is in investments. Okay. And okay. Uh, which I have invested via on the basis of Elliott Waves, various stocks, ETFs. And 20% um, could be trading capital. Okay. So, uh, talking about Elliott Waves, because you just mentioned, could you explain it to me like I'm a 12-year-old because I don't know about it? 12 is a great uh, <laughs> great forward step from a 5-year-old. That's, that's way too ahead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, you know, those uh, children have a very... The children have a game, a blocks game, where they have square, rectangle, circle, and there's one more shape, I don't know what. So, mm -hmm. uh, they have to put in the blocks. Okay. Uh, so, whatever is the shape, they'll look at the square and whatever is the whole they'll square. They'll figure it out. And, and they'll put right, it there. Right. So, uh, it's what exactly, basic, exactly what the mind is doing is that mind is looking for the pattern and where the pattern is fitting and okay. they're putting the block there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Elliott Waves is just a advanced form of patterns. So, if you give a child a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 wave, just a cutout of an impulse and the child has to uh, find the correct block and put it, a 5-year-old can put it. Right. But it's only when we try to make it very complicated with um, that, okay, that a second wave has to be this much or a third wave has to be this much, things get a little complicated. But if you just look at it a pattern as a pattern, an impulse as an impulse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or an A, B, C, simple right. lines and you have to just put it in the block, it's very simple. That's true. So it's doable. The, the only thing is that one has to have the visual skill while looking at the chart and then start getting into the mathematical part of it to measure that how much wave 2 has retraced, how much wave 3 has extended. Hmm. But if you look at a pattern as a pattern, it is doable. Okay. So, Elliott Waves as a theory is quite subjective as I'm aware. Not a lot of traders actually use this kind of strategy because it's too complicated and plus it's subjective in nature, right? Because there are no definite rules of entry or exit. So, how there is something that you have cracked in this approach. Could you tell us about that? What exactly is your approach of trading? So, Elliott Wave is not subjective. Okay. That's a myth. Elliott wave is dynamic but not subjective. Okay. Now there's a difference. Subjective would mean that uh, there's no clear rule, hmm. uh, which is also not the case. In fact, in an uh, in the course with Upsurge, I have listed all the all the rules that are needed for an Elliott wave pattern. So the problem is with the dynamism with part of it. Now let's just look at uh, a simple part that price is moving hmm. and uh, the price is at this point of time, the price is in the middle of the pattern formation. It has okay. not completed the pattern formation. Now, once, when it is forming, uh, you can have multiple thoughts that maybe it can go here and form this pattern, or maybe it can form an impulse, or maybe it can just form a zigzag, whatever. Various thoughts can come in uh, during the, when the pattern is still under formation. Hmm. But when the pattern has formed, you just have to pick that and put it in the block. Okay. So... Okay. A lot of people can't wait. It's the impatience of those practitioners which is causing the subjectivity. If you just wait for the pattern to complete, then measure it, life can be much easier. It's the trait of patience that is needed, uh, the exactness uh, of the understanding of the rules, okay. and then apply as and when the patterns end. So, so uh, are there any time frames that you take into consideration when the patterns are getting formed? So I follow uh, daily and 75 minute time frames. These okay. are the only two time frames that I follow. Uh, any other tools or indicators that you rely on apart from Elliott Waves? So if I am uh, talking to you, I am only talking to you. If I am uh, <laughs> practicing Elliott okay. Waves, I am only practicing okay. Elliott Waves. So I would not mix Elliott Waves with any other tool. I don't think that they need, uh, Elliott Waves is a complete science. In fact, I want to give one analogy here. When in 12th standard, there's a chapter called, there used to be a math chapter called trigonometry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there were, I think, 150 formulas in that single chapter. Okay. 
I, tan I've theta, cos theta. I yeah, yeah. So <laughs> those were very simpler ones. Achha. But then in 12th standard, there were far too many formulas. Okay, okay. So there were 150 formulas. I still remember that in my class of 50 students, less than five children knew the five students knew the entire 150 formulas because we were often asked. So all the remaining 45 used to right. get the punishment of stand up and raise your hands. Five used to be sitting. Okay. <laughs> Only five used to be sitting. I was in those uh-huh. five. Because I was, I could answer all the formulas. Hmm. Now, if who the number of pe- uh, children, number of students uh, from 50, uh, only five could remember the 150 formulas. Elliott waves also need that much kind of a grasp of the rules. Okay. So you can just immediately understand that if 50 people are trying to practice Elliott waves, not more than 10 to 20 percent are going to remember all the rules at any point of time. So the it's the memory issue also. The oh. second part is also the patience part of it, hmm. that you implement it when the pattern is ending. Oh, maybe. How do you handle situations when this Elliott wave pattern is actually not conforming to the market conditions? So that's a that's a in fact a paradox here because uh, looking at the chart, all patterns come under the universe of Elliott waves. Hmm. There is practically no pattern, nothing which is. Uh, nothing that is the price chart is doing which is outside the scope of Elliott waves. Oh. So, uh, but what happens is that now these are the few of the mistakes that even I do and I commit, uh, I make those errors and till date I am subject to those errors. I cannot escape them. Uh, so, there is a pattern called zigzag which hmm. is an ABC pattern. Then there is an X formation. Okay. And then there forms another ABC zigzag which is called a double zigzag. So, a zigzag with an X becomes a double zigzag. Now suppose at the end of zigzag, I think that the, no, the correction is over. Let me take a long position right here. Hmm. But it just goes a little bounce and then it forms another zigzag. So I have gone wrong. Uh, right. I was only anticipating a zigzag but then it has gone into a complex corrective. So when a simple corrective goes into a complex corrective, uh, there the trader can go wrong. The only way is to basically uh, go on the sidelines, exit your trade and then observe, wait for the pattern to show clarity again and then re-enter. Okay. So the uh, coming to your question, what do I do when th- these uh, patterns are not confirming to the market action? I would exit and go on okay. the sidelines and okay. observe again. I will take the hit. You would wait it out and then yeah. probably take another. Take the, take the stop loss, exit the trade, uh, go on the sidelines and then observe and then maybe re-enter again. So, what could you explain to us what your strategy is about exactly? So, uh, ideally, I prefer uh, playing a wave too low. Suppose it's a wave 1, 2, 3, 4, okay. 5 impulse. Okay. I would ideally wait for a wave 2 bottom and go long for or go short for a wave 3. Try to trade a wave 3 and then wait out for a wave 4. I wait for the corrective patterns to end hmm. and because in most cases what happens is that after a corrective pattern ends, there are chances of a chances of an okay, impulse, impulse okay. which is a trending move. Hmm. So my entire strategy is always to wait out the corrective patterns. So the basically corrective patterns are also very difficult to read. Hmm. Uh, the number of complexities of rules and everything, chances of going wrong are also higher. But the risk reward is tremendous, is terrific. Okay. So uh, the mastery has to be there. If you want to play Elliott waves, then you have to understand corrective patterns first. Right. Because there the real cream of the money is going to come from. End of the corrective pattern, after the termination of the corrective pattern, trade a, take a contrarian trade in the, okay. for the opposite Got direction, basically. Got it. So, uh, in all this, do you actually track macroeconomic events also? Like, you seem to be closely following the US markets how you know the inflation rate is now slowly you know stabilizing so does this in any way impact your trades for the day absolutely yes uh, so till uh, you can say till 3 4 years ago i was not able to crack this macro code okay because uh, we always used to see that markets have moved 15 20% 25% and i wish i could understand that the markets were supposed to move so much. Mm. You know, when the markets are moving so much in a strong trending direction, then whatever contrarian trades you are taking, suppose they are rising and you are shorting, or they are falling and you are taking long positions, they are bound to go wrong conti- continuously and you are right. you are going to hit the drawdowns. Right. 
But if you understand that the, they are driven by macro factors, then you can avoid those whipsaw trades and you can play with that direction. Macros, there are, uh, there is a lot of, there's a range of data in macros. Hmm. But I have understood that there are only four major parameters. Hmm. If you only uh, follow them, then uh, if you understand their correlations to equities, that's probably just enough. Got it. Yields is one of them, which is a function of interest rate. Interest rates, right. Crude oil, gold and dollar index. I think that's enough. So could you explain to us in simple terms how this cycle works, the whole commodities and gold, crude, currency markets, how they are correlated to the stock market, Indian stock market in specific? So let's understand uh, one at a time. Yeah. So uh, when yields are there, so currently yields are hovering at around 4.5, hmm. they've come off from 5. We are talking only about US yields. Okay. We're talking about US yields because US is the uh, superpower, superpower right now yeah. and the, all the money uh, basically gets driven from there and to there. So uh, in the yields part of it, if the yields are coming down, uh, what happens, what's happening there is that uh, the institutional money is chasing the bonds. Okay. That is why the yields are crashing. So if the yields are crashing, the money is going to the bonds. Will uh, that institutional money also come into emerging markets? The chances are lesser. Okay. So uh, the idea is that if the yields are crashing, the chances of that money coming into... Uh, the money is going to the safer haven. Uh, right. They want to stick... The, the institutional money is going to the bonds, US bonds. So obviously, emerging markets is a higher risk asset. So in between, the institutions have chosen bonds. bonds. There is something to be figured out there. Hmm. Uh, the second part is dollar index. Now, dollar index uh, is the, obviously, dollar is the reserve currency for the world right now, thanks to petrodollar hmm. as well. So uh, when dollar index is rising, what's happening is that it is uh, making the commodities costlier. Mostly like uh, copper gets costlier because they are coated in dollars. So obviously all the currents, all the commodities that are coated in dollar are also getting costlier. Okay. So they are having a negative correlation with the emerging markets. Okay. So okay. Because emerging markets are consu consumers of all these major commodities. Right. They're right. not the producers of it. Right. We are the consumers of it. Hmm. So uh, all these commodities become costlier for emerging markets, which is a net negative. Hmm. So a rising dollar becomes a net negative for uh, emerging yeah. markets. Okay. Gold is a is a risk off risk on kind of a trade. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, if most of the central banks are holding gold and there's a chase in the gold prices across uh, if there's a chase in the gold prices then obviously you can understand that a risk off is happening in the markets at this point of time. So uh, maybe the money is probably f flowing into the uh, lesser risk instrument. Okay. Got it. Uh, so, which is again, chase in the gold prices is also a negative for you it's want. It's like a safe haven, right? It's correct. Like a cushion for you investors. want you want gold prices to remain maybe stable or uh, slightly coming off, which is good for us, but not rising heavily. Hmm. Hmm. So that is what we don't want. Now, trick. Uh, crude oil is a little tricky. Okay. Crude oil is also a demand gauge because it is used in probably 15-20 industries as an input. It is also used by for the automobiles as a consumption item. Hmm. So uh, crude oil is somewhat tricky. Uh, if it is rising, when it is probably below 90 and 100 dollars a barrel as Brent is, so if it is rising, it has a positive correlation with equities because it is a demand gauge. Okay. But the moment it crosses 100, 110, uh, it becomes as an inflation worry. Oh, okay. Because then uh, for emerging markets like us who are net crude importers, we are going to be hit by inflation. Hmm. Hmm. So a, a rising in crude price uh, beyond a point, beyond a threshold, uh, beyond a threshold is a net negative for emerging markets then. So historically, uh, we've also seen one more relationship that when FII start pumping money into our economy, we tend to see the markets going up. Right. Does this also hold in, hold some value in your trading setup? FII's, uh, no, I look at FII's data in the larger cycles, in the larger context. But FII data to understand uh, from the very large cycles point of view is probably a little bit important. Hmm. Uh, though there are two parameters here, one is FII, uh, the foreign investors point of view, foreign investors perspective, one is domestic investors perspective. 
So from the foreign investors perspective, uh, let's look at this way that they would equate all the indexes in the same uh, in, on the same units. So for instance, they will not consider Nifty's uh, rise from 10,000 to 20,000 hmm. as 2x. Okay. They will see it, they will divide 10,000 when Nifty was whatever US dollar was at that point of time. Oh. And how much has Nifty moved in the US dollar terms? Got because it. they are getting their US dollars to India. So, uh, just to give you some comparison, the 2008 high uh, in, uh, on Nifty was 6300 something. In US dollar terms, uh, 6350 something divided by the US dollar at that point of time, the unit was around 160. Okay. And the, and the current Nifty divided by US dollar in US dollar terms is around 240. Oh. That is it. So, from 2008 high, Till now, we have practically grown only 50% in absolute terms. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, what was say uh, SPX, S&P 500, US mm -hmm. S&P 500 was at around 1500 at that point of time, Makes 2007 sense. high, mm -hmm. 2007, 2008 high and is now at around 4500 which is 3x. Oh, okay. And uh, NASDAQ which was probably around 3000, uh, 2007, 2008 high is now 15, 16,000. Hmm, hmm. So it's 5x. So they would be gauging from uh, as a with the denominator of US dollar in US dollar terms. Uh, that is why you can see that while US while FIIs were pumping money earlier in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13 as well, uh, the major part of the last since last one one and a half years they have been net sellers. Oh, okay. Uh, because in overall terms, Nifty is performing lesser than, uh, not as good as what uh, US indexes are doing. Right. So their uh, understanding is different. Now coming to, so this is great from the larger cycle point of hmm. view. Hmm. But from the domestic investor point of view, now SIP book is very growing, uh, retail money is yeah. uh, probably, now FIs are sellers. Promoters are also reducing their stakes in their own companies. Uh, even government is probably looking to pay right. their stake in mm. uh, public sector units. But retail is very confident about Indian markets right now, which is good. And retail is the only reason why where why markets are holding up right now, and okay. uh, which has which was not the case earlier. In uh, earlier corrections, in earlier times, retail book was not very strong. Mm. SIP book was mm. not very strong. So retail is giving a lot of support to the market. But what is also happening is that let's look at this way that from October 2021, Nifty was probably at around 18,600, 18,700 at that point of time. Yeah. And now it is um, 19,700. It made a high of 20,200. Hmm, hmm. So the uh, if you had put money in government securities at that point of time at 7% yield, you would have beaten Nifty. Oh. So in the last two years, Nifty has not been able to beat a government, a government security, security index, which oh. the uh, domestic investors will be able to realize. Uh, mm. Obviously, it's a very basic calculation that my returns are not even 7% in the large caps. So, domestic investors' point of view would be comparing the domestic asset classes, mm. which are government securities, gold and, Equity. and large caps. Mm. Now, small caps, micro caps, they are doing exceedingly well. Mm. But how much allocation do people have in those? probably 10 20 percent uh, nobody has no large investor ever has 80 percent small caps okay. very few only with some who who have probably done extensive research but barring that most people are passive investors hmm. who uh, invest more in the large caps large caps are right now not able to beat government true. securities true right so because you mentioned that you deal with your entire capital in the markets uh, how do you manage risk? Because risk is an important factor in your uh, trading setup, right? So uh, there are two, three layers to the risk part of it. For first part is that you have to understand that uh, you get in the right cycle of the markets. So if it's a so using those macros, uh, if I am able to time that, it's not the best time to long or sh short. It's probably not the best time to short. I would rather take less shorts. Okay. and go more longs. Okay. So those positioning and the position bias, 
uh, forms through macros to some extent. That is part one of a, if you are, if I'm able to do the right positioning in the market, some bit of risk is taken care of right there. Okay. Uh, if I'm not very clear with the macros, I would just trade light and trade long short both, but trade light. Hmm. Hmm. The heavier positions I would take only when macros are behind me, and when there's a, I, I'm able to understand what the larger macro structure of the market is. The second part is uh, overall positioning size, overall positions that never take more than 5% or 10% from the trading capital, a single position as a from the entire trading capital. Mm -hmm. So as a futures trader, hmm. because I'm, uh, I have to understand that if I hit the drawdown in that, so I should not be, it should, it should not throw me out of the game. Okay. okay. I want to stay in the game. I want to earn on a regular basis. I can handle a month on month drawdown, but quarterly, quarter drawdowns are very difficult to come back from. Oh. So once you hit uh, a 5% drawdown, once I start hitting a 5% drawdown, I uh, reduce my position sizing Got overall it. and try to recover, try to go slow. Uh, so back then I was far more adventurous. I used to wait till 8, 10%. I never used to bother. But now 5% is my threshold from where I increase my alertness. Because even next trade, what I'm going to do after a 5% drawdown or a 7% drawdown, I'm only taking a chance. Even okay. that can go into a okay. stop loss. Even that can hit the right. stop loss. Right. So even uh, so, there's no way to guarantee that from five percent I'll come back to zero. zero. Hmm. Uh, the the only thing is that I should pare down my position sizing so that I don't hit ten. Yeah. I try yeah. to control between five and ten. So your stop loss is at five percent. That is. So from five is my aler alert point. Alert point. So okay. from there I reduce my position sizing and then I try to handle the things in a more. Uh, I try to bet more with the. Uh, pa patterns that I'm more confident about. Got it. So uh, let's say that tomorrow there's an RBI event and they're going to announce some major policy changes. That one day of, you know, some macroeconomic changes are not going to impact your strategy in any way, just to be clear. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at okay. all. Because first of all, all my positions, uh, intraday, oh, there's always a stop in the system. And okay. uh, overnight, I'm always carrying a hedge via options. Got it. So I have never carried any futures position overnight without hmm. a hedge. And uh, how much are you in favor of automated trades? Are you a system based trader or you know you are a discretionary trader? How does it work? So initially I was a discretionary trader. Everybody hmm. starts as a discretionary trader. And then what happens is that the natural evolvement happens. We become rule based traders. Right. We start writing that forget about the news, forget about the events. I'll make my entry rule. I'll make my exit rule. Okay. Uh, from the exit rule, it can be profit exit, it can be loss exit, it can be trailing stop loss exit, whatever exits. Hmm. Exits are far more difficult to define, but whatever it is, you have to define the rules. So uh, from discretionary, rule based, then you become, okay, now I know coding also. Coding. So let me, uh, make, let me automate it. So if I can write a rule objectively, I can also, and if I can also code it, then I would code it. Then I would at least code the signal generation part of it. Hmm. Then from signal generation comes uh, automated execution. Okay. Then the automated execution part happens is that, okay, you have to look at the APIs part and everything, but at least the signal generation part should be automated. If I can automate it, I would rather automate it. Hmm. And what is your opinion on the uh, entire AI and machine learning uh, trend that is picking up right now? Do you think it's the future in trading? How is it going to work? So machines are definitely going to dominate, that is clear. And the reason is that um, we are going to give more and more responsibility to the machines hmm. to find out what is right. But what can machine do is only what we ask them to do. Right. So only a human brain behind uh, can give uh, the right commands to the machine on what all possibilities the machine should be looking at, hmm. what all patterns the machine should be looking at, how should the machine evolve into the more uh, complex algo or something. Now, there can be a different way of doing it, but uh, the way I understand it is that it cannot be a game changer. Okay. The human brain will still dominate, uh, not the discretionary uh, formation of it, not the discretionary trader, but, but the uh, fact that somebody who can adapt Okay. Uh, with the changing market conditions, evolve and uh, use that 
by making complex algos themselves and then deploy. The machines, AI and ML means that the machine is learning and they will deploy something automatically. So, which has limited scope in my opinion. Got it. And any upcoming trends or events that you are keeping a track of? Any Anything that you are currently, you know, actively looking at? Uh, in the markets? Yeah, uh, in the markets. Uh, so, uh, I would look at, at this point of time, I would primarily look at gold. Okay. Because gold has been sitting under $2,000 since consolidating it since several years now. So, if it 2000, 2050, I guess. So, if it breaks past that, that can be a major global event oh, okay. of risk off in the markets. Okay. So, that is one major event that I would be looking at. The second major event I would be looking at is uh, US 10 year yields, which are which have come off from 5 to 4.5 right now. Hmm. Uh, but if inflation is cooling off and if there's a change in the bonds there, then that will be another risk off event. Okay. So, these are the two major events I'll be looking at. Hmm. And uh, how would you characterize the current state of the Indian economy? Do you think it's, you know, bullish, bearish, sideways? How is it uh, in your opinion? So, uh, at this point of time, I believe that, as I said, that uh, domestic money is really ruling the yes, yes, roost yes. right now. Hmm. Uh, so, at some point of time, we are probably going to see some saturation there markets might consolidate. So, that all things are going to happen. But Indian base consumption economy is very strong. Okay. So, there is no uh, case of a recession in India. That is not visible. Hmm. Not okay. visible at okay. all. So, consolidation part can happen and should happen also. It's uh, healthier to happen. In fact, I want to take an example from uh, US markets. Okay. What happened in 1950s and early 1960s in the US was that um, the Americans had that confidence in themselves that they are going to be the superpowers of the world. So, uh, the newer stocks were getting listed in the US stock market. They were called the go-go years mm -hmm. of US and every stock was getting, there was a wave of strong nationalism in the US and uh, the people who had never invested in stock market was starting to invest in stock market. Oh. And suddenly from 2-3%, 4% penetration, uh, they started having 10 to 12 percent penetration in the 1960s. Hmm. But uh, obviously, stock markets have a, have their own peak points. They consolidated for about a decade or so. There, the consolidation was different, probably much longer. I cannot say the same what will happen in India or something. But what later on happened in the US, uh, this is far more important. In 19 from 1982 to till 2000, Dow Jones went 10x. Okay. Uh, and from there, and what happened during that, those two decades was uh, the number of Americans that were participating in the US stock markets went up from about 10-12% to about 50%. 50%. Oh. So that was a huge jump. Hmm. Bull market attracts people to stock markets. Right now we are having say about 10 crore DMAT accounts, which is probably a little more than 6%, 7% of our population, 7% of our total population. So. Uh, Obviously, we have our different literacy ratios also yeah. as compared to US. But I, what I do see is that uh, even after, say, hitting some saturation point, maybe in a year or two, whenever we hit that and, and markets consolidate, whenever the next bull run happens, the major part of the money is definitely going to come in stock markets. Maybe if not 40, 50 percent, we might just see 25, 30 percent of the Indians getting into stock markets. stock markets. I think right now we have about 4% of the population which is in the stock markets. So, which is probably trading. Probably trading, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, that is going to, this number is going to have a lot of rise, but they are not going to come in during consolidation or correction phase. Correct. Only bull markets bull attract markets. money because it's obviously the lure of easy money. Yeah. yeah. It's, as I said, the dense jungle people get lost initially, but then eventually find, after 2-3 years of survival, in case they survive, they find their ways. They want to become traders, different kind of traders or investors and then they pick their sub streams. Got it. Hmm. But those two, three years are important. So, bull markets give them that cushion. Okay. So, people generally come during bull markets. Uh, newer investors, retail investors generally come during bull markets and India has a lot of scope. Understood. So, if you look at a very lo long term, long term story, longer picture for India, it's only positive. 
consolidations and corrections are definitely going to come though so it's india's decade yeah. india's decade india's <laughs> next two decades next two decades yeah. right thank you so much piyush i just have a small rapid fire round to end this okay uh, you can be as quick as you I'll you be. can be as witty as you are on twitter <laughs> so the first question is uh, which is more dear or to you wave analytics or trading chakra wow <laughs> uh, this is this this cannot be the question this should not be allowed <laughs> but uh, i'm close to both of them okay wave analytics was my first venture so probably a little closer to that yeah. but and trading chakra is very new uh, so i'm still building the community so maybe 5149 so the conclusion 5149 to wave analytics so the conclusion to this question is that first child is always special <laughs> <laughs> uh one favorite movie or book on stock markets oh uh, movie and book so movie would be wall street because that was one of the first movies i had watched yeah. and that fierce commanding michael douglas playing gordon gekko was had a huge okay. impact on me yeah. um book would be come into my trading room by alexander elder because that literally had an impact on how the psychology should play how risk management should be how uh, the technicals should be so that with that there was a hope after reading that book i literally had a hope that i can become a trader so these were these these were some of the first impressions and i think first impressions really matter yeah uh third is dalal street or a tropical beach for a vacation beach any day <laughs> <laughs> i would literally chill on Amazing. a beach <laughs> in one word how would you describe the feeling of hitting a big win so big win uh, used to be very satisfactory in the initial years but now big win is only uh, mildly satisfactory okay that okay i've been on the right path now uh the bigger satisfaction is also when i don't hit the big loss ha huh. so yes yes so big win is satisfactory uh, yes that i am on the right track okay tea or coffee to stay alert during market hours coffee any day black okay uh, i am addicted to black coffee at some point of time i thought that i'll name my company black coffee <laughs> i was so impressed oh. by the st- sim- stimulation that it <laughs> stimulation that it does to my brain so i literally loved it all all together nice if you could give one piece of trading advice to your younger self what would it be work work very hard on the technicals and uh, keep your risk and leverage in control uh, because the maximum money i lost in my initial years was all was not only because my technicals were a little loose but also i was over leveraged most of the mm-hmm. time so okay. leverage was the major reason for my uh, major struggle of the initial years oh If you could have dinner with one famous trader, could be dead or alive, who would it be? Paul Tudor Jones, P. T. Jones. Okay. Uh, he somewhere he was the first person whose documentary I had watched. His documentary was shot in somewhere in 1980s. Uh, it's there on YouTube, very raw footage, hmm. and uh, uh, he was talking about Elliott waves. Oh. Now this guy had decoded something about Elliott waves, and after that. he goes completely uh, aloof somewhere and never speaks about elliot waves again but he does elliot waves which he has spoken on many on a few forums but he does not talk about how he does it how he does it so mm-hmm. if i if i can get his secrets out so i think there and he became a billionaire oh. so obviously he has cracked a far greater code yeah what's your most memorable trade whether it was a win or a loss So in fact uh, 2022 was very good uh, where I could get the cycle stops and bottoms very well and I could trade heavily on both cycle stops and bottoms okay so uh, and I was able to combine macros with it uh, so that literally gave me that uh, confidence hmm. that all those things put in together which I was working on are now working okay so uh, 2022 was pretty good interesting yeah bull or bear market which one do you find more interesting uh i am agnostic to the direction <laughs> okay. as long as i am able to get my i am a contrarian trader by nature okay so i like to get the right peaks and troughs hmm. if hmm. i am able to get short the peak and long the trough i am happy okay. so i i would uh, i w- i have no uh, you're indifferent to indifferent to bulls and bear markets i just right. want my cycles to be correct <laughs> right What do you think is the most important skill for traders to have in the future? 
irrespective of what they can make algos or trading systems or whatever emotional discipline is going to be the key okay so if you can control your own emotions the cycles of fear greed hope panic you are going to survive you are going to thrive hmm. now the last question you can't think for a second also okay virat kohli or rohit sharma virat kohli mental okay. strength physical strength okay great <laughs> thank you so much piyush it was thank lovely you. having you here pleasure all mine